everyone. In this video, I'm going to examine how a Baptist interprets the Nicene Creed, specifically the portion uh, one baptism for the remission of sins, and that, of course, is connected to Acts 2.38. So I want to first give a brief overview of what I see as the, the kind of three broad approaches to church history that I find among Baptists or Evangelicals and Pentecostals. Of course, there are going to be nuances, but um, these are the three that I have personally encountered, and I think most people will say that they have found with these groups as well. The first view is going to be your kind of, your strong restorationist view, which is that while the church just fell away, the church just, it, it was gone, or the, you know, the, the Catholic tradition, so to speak, that of Augustine Ambrose, that was not the church, just not a true church. And um, it wasn't until the Reformation that the true church returned, so to speak. We lost it very on the kind of this idea of a great apostasy. I don't know of too many Baptists that explicitly say this, um, but I do see this personally just from what I've encountered with, with people uh, the churches I went to growing up, this attitude of, well, don't read these figures because what they are teaching is ultimately heretical. They are not the true church. We figured it out. And they'll they'll look at the Reformation not as taking what's good from church history um, and and really hiding, uh, not hiding, but uh, repudiating or reforming what's bad um, as much as they're saying, well, we are restoring what was actually just fundamentally lost. There was basically nobody there. There's no one we can point to and say they were correct. Uh, for really serious, certain really serious issues of theology. I think that view is extremely untenable and it puts you in the category of like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons because that's what they'll say regarding things like the Trinity. Um, the second view that I see, which is a little bit more common than that one, is going to be your kind of landmarkism. So this is what I found among independent fundamental Baptists and John MacArthur also holds to it, which it's, it's admittedly funny to me, um, which is basically that, well, there is a... a tradition, there is a group or a, or a series of groups that are like proto-Baptists. These are your Baptists throughout history. Um, and they are not the the, the church Catholic as, as it would be called. This is a these are groups that are often condemned by the church and the Baptists are being persecuted. So some of the, the groups they'll talk about, they'll say Montanists, they'll say Novatians, Donatists, Paulicians. And then of course in the medieval era you'll have you know the Waldensians among others. I think this is laughably bad um because if you actually see what the condemnations are of the novations down and so on a lot of that stuff is just straight heretical and especially i just laugh because with the donatists it's like the entire idea the donatists have is actually quite contrary to baptist i have a hard time finding all of these groups or any of these groups really and saying yes you would fit into a modern baptist church it's just not the case in my mind at all um but this is losing its its popularity because I think most people recognize what I just said that it's simply untenable and there's no no one really takes this seriously seriously who's read it. They they effectively have to say, oh yeah, well all these writings and all these quotations of the figures that are of those heresies they're all forged or they're all fake or something that would make them look worse than they are. So it's effectively unfalsifiable or um, and, and hence really unuseful here or no value on something that should be falsifiable. The third view is the one that I'm seeing more so in, in, in a good way, which is that there's a real attempt to reconcile Baptist theology or evangelical theology with um, church history. There has been some really good stuff that I've seen from them. I've seen really good stuff from the Credo guys um, who have been putting things out on, on divine simplicity and classical theism. Now, I don't necessarily think they have the best interpretations of somebody like Scotus. I think it's really the, the scholarship there is shoddy, and I've heard mixed things about them and some things, but I certainly prefer them to somebody like James White. Um, or your average evangelical that I found where they kind of hold to like mono polytheism, as, as some have called it. Um, when I was in California, I went to a, an evangelical church, for example, where I'm like 95% sure their pastor was an open theist. Like I, I'm like 95% sure. And he's a relatively big name, I should say. Um, maybe he's changed his view since. And I, I haven't, of course, gone to the church for like five years as of recording this. But um, suffice it to say that in light of this, there is a real attempt among Baptists that I have found to say, all right, how are our views um, found? Like, how, how do we look at our views? And, and does it really match what the early church says? Can we hold to our views while saying that we are a continuation of the beliefs of, um, say, even, you know, those fathers before the Nicene Creed and uh, hopefully after as well? And today I want to look at one of those examples, specifically with the Nicene Creed. So there's been a discussion recently. I mean, it always... It always pops up again, but I thought 
this thread was especially worth examining um, as to how exactly a Baptist could interpret the passage, the, the, the phrase one baptism for the remission of sins, because I do believe that pretty much the rest of the Nicene Creed, they could affirm a lot of Baptists, again, are doing good stuff on Trinitarian theology. Um, and I, I think the the one holy Catholic apostolic church is or the one, well, you know, the you know, the passage in there. I don't think that's legitimately a problem for like a Baptist because the word Catholic there would just mean universal. It, I think that's a fine thing to take. And putting modern ecclesiology, like trying trying to fit ancient ecclesiology into modern stuff is really difficult. Um, but that's a topic for another day. The the passage that's especially of, re of relevance here is this um, I believe in one baptism for the remission of sins. And so what I'm gonna look at today is this thread that I found um, that popped up in my feed about um, how a Baptist could take that phrase, the Nicene Creed, how they could interpret it and and say it publicly and say this in a positive way. Um, and I think it ultimately does not succeed, frankly. So um, I'm going to pull that up and just briefly read it because it's going to touch on issues of, um, of his history, but also just exegesis in general. Okay, so I'll read it out in case this is really small for you guys. I, I can try to zoom in just a little bit more. Okay, um, and I should say I feel I feel comfortable doing this. I, I've not contacted uh, Tom Hicks about this, but he put it out publicly. I feel confident talking about it this way. Uh, if he were to message me and say he weren't comfortable with this, I, you know, I, I would be okay with having like a dialogue with him or something like that where um, we discuss whether he'd want this, but I personally take this as something that I can critique publicly because he put it out publicly for people to see. It's being you know, retweeted. He's not a private account or anything. Um, this is something to educate people. So I want to examine that in that light. Anyway, so this is his take. The Nicene Creed says, I believe in one baptism for the remission of sins. Do Baptists believe this? Absolutely. It is a direct quotation from Acts 2.38. Okay. That is that is correct. He cites Acts 238 here. I mean, it's not a one-to-one, -one, like it's not absolutely exact, but yeah, it's really just a quote of Acts 238. Like somebody who's read Acts a fair amount of times and comes across the 19th Creed, they're gonna make that obvious connection. That's correct. Um, he says this text is often produced as a primary support for various forms of baptismal regeneration and the necessity of baptism for salvation. It's claimed that this passage teaches that repentance and baptism are both necessary to obtain the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, that's that's true. This is one of those passages that I have used before to talk about it. Um, and for for good reason, I'm going to explain why in the responses to some to his arguments here. Um, but suffice it to say that it is one of those verses that when you read our dogmaticians, when you talk to really anybody that holds baptism regeneration and the idea that baptism forgives sins, this is one of those passages. It's a, it's a go to. Um, I don't use it as much as something like First Peter three, but I think this is a very, very strong passage for it, because this is the preaching. This isn't. Um, like this is reaching to the people, to people who are not converted yet. Um, so that's pretty important. Anyway, he says, but the Greek word translated for can be taken in two ways, either unto or because of. The Greek word there is ice. Um, and he says, if the sense is unto the forgiveness of sins, then the word forgiveness does not refer to the procurement of forgiveness of sins, which was done by Christ on the cross. Rather, it refers to the subjective termination of forgiveness upon the soul of the believer who repents and is baptized. Okay. So yeah, this is broadly, I mean, it's broadly correct. Maybe I wouldn't use fully this language as though it's like, um, does not refer to the pure um, procurement of forgiveness of sins, which is done by Christ on the cross. I would say that it obviously is connected, but I think the language here is just a bit ambiguous. I don't think he's accusing us of saying something like, oh, Christ is not important for us here. Um, but what I, I do want to address briefly that uh, there are people who will say things like, well, baptism doesn't save, Jesus saves. Well, okay, well, you can expand that to say a baptism or faith doesn't save Jesus saves. And you have a problem here. This is where we get into the idea of grounding and you have things like instrumental and um, or approximate remote causality in, in terms of the order of efficiency and all that. So uh, in the Lutheran view and pretty much every view that I know of, <laughs> baptism, it, the reason it saves is not like, oh, Christ did this thing over here and then baptism does this other thing. Like it, it's its own ground, so to speak, as much as it's well, it has its grounding in light of the work that Christ um, performed in his life. And um, that's not to say it in the sense of like every single view is absolutely the same on it, because obviously Roman Catholics and Lutherans are going to disagree. Um, there are nuances in the various views to how baptism is applied. Well, why is it? 
why does it work on infants where, you know, these, the uh, ex opere operato view of Rome versus our view or faith where infants have faith. Not that Rome will deny that per se, um, but it's going to look different. I recognize that. Um, and sorry for the flashing like message. I don't know why it's doing that. My apologies here. Um, point is though, broadly, that is, that is the view of somebody who's going to affirm something like baptismal regeneration. Um, and he's going to contrast that. So further commenting on this verse, John Gill says that the baptism of believers, quote, their faith might be led to Christ who suffered and died for their sins, who left them buried in the grave and who rose again for the justification from them. And now he says, but the word for can be translated because. So the word ice can be translated because. If that's the meaning, then Peter was telling these men who'd already been convicted by the message of the gospel to repent publicly of participating in the murder of Jesus as the Christ and to accept public baptism in his name because their sins had already been forgiven. For these men, baptism was necessarily public proof of their repentance and forgiveness of sins. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. What he's saying is that this alternate view, which is the alternate view the Baptists take that I found, is that the word for there, the word ice in the Greek, um, means, well, you're baptized because of the, the remission of sins. Um, it's kind of like saying... You know, and, and you'll see this, like no one says this is really bad language or grammar, but you'll see in some writings like, oh, yes, uh, you know, let, let's I'll make up some situation like, oh, you know, James married Sarah for he loved her. You know, like, yeah, I mean, that's that's a sentence that people would say. And so what he's trying to say is something similar is going on there. The passage then would mean, you know, be uh, be baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. Whereas the view he holds to, or what he's saying that baptismal regeneration view says is be baptized unto the forgiveness of sins, that you are baptized so that you may get the forgiveness of sins, whereas his view is you are baptized because you already have it. Um, now, there are a few problems with this view. I, I've addressed it before, but I thought I'd briefly do it now. Number one is just going to be that um, <laughs> The, using the word ice as as for in this way is extremely controversial. Um, I, I think it was Wolf Mueller who once talked about this, where when he was looking into the issue, he heard this same argument. And so he was looking like, all right, well, why? Let, let's find, let me find a Bible that translates it this way. And he looked all over for a Bible that translates this passage as because. Um, and ultimately, the only one he found after scouring turned out to be a, effectively a paraphrase. So it was just pushing the theology in. It was an explanation of it. So there's no real translation. Um, effectively, I, I'd say there's a reason why, why we aren't seeing it translated as because. I think that is important. Now, I am not going to say that I am an absolute expert on the Greek here. But what I will say is that from everything I've seen, I haven't seen way too much. That's like, oh, here's a, a really intense scholarly debate as much as it's very few people hold that. And it is. it appears to be in light of their theological um, presuppositions. But even not looking too much just at like the Greek, the way the grammar works, it, it really makes sense in light of what Peter is trying to say. You have this group of people that Peter, there's the law, right? Peter gives the law. And they're saying, what do we do to be saved? In our view, Peter's saying, to be saved, you go get baptized. That's where you receive the forgiveness of sins. Okay, repent, be baptized. Yeah, that makes sense. But if you use this because of, <laughs> the question is, what do we do to be saved? And Peter's like, oh, be baptized because you've been saved. Like that, that doesn't answer their question at all. Ironically, it, it turns it turns it into law, really. Like it's again, it's your first act of obedience. It turns baptism into law, and that that doesn't help them at all. It's all right. This is something you have to do now. Now that you're saved, which he doesn't say how, you have to do this for God. This is your law. That's not one. It's not comforting. Two, it doesn't answer their question at all. So it's not that helpful in my mind. Another thing that's important is, well, we see the same thing in other passages that are not about baptism. So in Matthew 26, 28, for example, quote, this is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, the way we're going to read that is obviously the for the remission of sins is to, to obtain it. Christ dies so that we obtain it. But the same grammar there in the Greek, as far as I know, um, from from the various uh, sources I've read on this, is <laughs> is that if you it, it uses the same exact or not maybe that absolutely exact but such similar language to um, Acts two that it can effectively be identical, and that 
<laughs> if you were to apply it to Acts 2, you'd have to apply it here too, where you'd basically be saying <laughs> that uh, <laughs> Jesus was, went to the cross because the people's sins were already forgiven, which no one holds that, right? Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a big problem. You'd have to hold one view. Well, either way, you'd have this massive inconsistency, whereas in our view, we're consistent. It's Jesus goes to the cross to procure our forgiveness of sins, and we get baptized so we may receive the application thereof. Whereas on their view, it's, well, one time it happens to procure it, and another time it happens because of it. And the grammar is so similar that uh, in this one case, it's just completely different really for no reason other than the theological motivations, um, which again are highly disputed. And this is um, what I'm trying to get at here overall is just because something can be translated in a way like, oh yeah, you know, I can do it that way. It doesn't mean you should. It doesn't mean it's valid or, or as good. The way it's being portrayed by a lot of Baptists that I've encountered is, well, it can just equally, it's equally valid to, to translate it that way. It makes sense of the text. So it's, it is compatible with our view. That's just not true at all. It's simply not the case that, yeah, this passage is a great way to interpret it or, or a great way to interpret the passages by translating it that way. There's a reason translators don't do it that way. That would take away the ambiguity for one. Um, but on top of that, and this is just something I wish he addressed, but he doesn't, is this isn't how the early church takes it either. Like, it frustrates me when I talk to people about uh, a lot of issues, frankly, but it's going to be the case here where it's not as much, okay, here's an argument for the fathers taking their view. They don't, they don't say, okay, here's a father that definitely takes our view as much as it's, well, here's a statement of the father that sounds like the baptismal regeneration view, but we, we can affirm this. Like we can do it. You know, notice that the argument wasn't the, the Nicene Creed actually means our view as much as it was in a very roundabout way. We can interpret it um, in a, in a way that it's compatible with Baptist theology. Just frankly, if you read the Nicene father, the proto-Nicene or the anti-Nicene fathers, what you're going to find is they're not interpreting it the Baptist way. Uh, and, uh, and definitely not those after the Nicene Council. I mean, I don't even have to talk about Augustine, but just a few citations. Uh, I mean, anybody can find these. There's so many resources on it, but I just thought I'd mention a few of them regarding this. Um, so from uh, fragment 34 of Irenaeus's fragments, we have Quote, and he and dipped himself, says the scripture, seven times in Jordan. It was not for nothing that Naaman of old, when suffering from leprosy, was purified upon being baptized, but it served as an indication for us. For as we are lepers in sin, we are made clean by the means of sacred water and the invocation of the Lord from our old transgressions, being spiritually regeneration, regenerated as newborn babes, even as the Lord has declared. Except a man be born again through water and the spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's saying John 3, 5 there. Um, and we also have Justin Martyr's first apology, quote, as many, as many as are persuaded and believe what we Christian teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live accordingly, um, and so on, talking about regeneration, are brought to by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we, uh, which we ourselves regenerated or we were regenerated. For in the name of God, the Father, and the Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing of water. For Christ also said, except you be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay. And then, happy, and then this is Tertullian from On Baptism. Happy is our sacrament of water, in that by washing away the sins of our early blindness, we are set free and admitted into eternal life. There's, And that's from his uh, On Baptism, that treatise. I, I don't know anybody that's going to try to make an argument at the very least that Tertullian was a, um, denies uh, baptismal regeneration. It's very hard to look at these fathers and say something like they clearly deny baptismal regeneration. At absolute best, what you can say is, oh, well, it's ambiguous enough that our view is, or the Baptist view is uh, tenable. But that's, I don't think that's really a good way to do things personally. I, it gets frustrating when what you're looking at is, well, here's something that makes way more sense in light of a baptismal regeneration view. And they say, well, if if you make it as unclear as possible, if you interpret it in a really, really unclear way, in a way that you know makes their statement super ambiguous, then it's kind of compatible with our view. I, I don't think that's personally a good way to go about doing things. And I see this a ton with other issues. Um, that's what I see actually with the social, you know, Trinitarians with their interpretation of the word person, which is where they're like, oh, they say the word person here. And we'll just like interpret our modern definition of person into 
um, Trinitarian theology, and ultimately they believe in heresy. So it's it's pretty bad. Overall, the point of this video is that I don't think there is a consistent way in which Baptists can uphold the Nicene Creed, at least on this portion. Um, I, As much as I do love my Baptist friends who are trying to reconcile their views with the fathers, um, some places their views are reconcilable, again, again, in terms of things like the Trinity, divine simplicity, all that stuff. Um, but I think on this issue of baptism, it is effectively impossible to um, read one's view into the Nicene Creed without just destroying it entirely, because I don't know of any arguments that would, I don't know of anything that could really say, oh yeah, the, the Nicene fathers were definitely interpreting the Nicene Creed this way when they were doing it and saying in light of their liturgy, in light of their own statements and their documents, th there's just nothing there that would make me think this is how they interpreted uh, that passage. So with that in mind, uh, thanks for watching. This is a bit of a lighter video relative to the other stuff that I have done. But if people are really interested in this and me analyzing baptism a bit more, just let me know. It's one of those topics that I think a lot of people are interested in because it's such a contentious issue. And it's one of those things that like, at least for me, it was the case that once I read the fathers on this, I'm like, all right, I really got to reconsider a lot of the things I think. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, thanks again. See you all later. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching another Scholastic Lutherans video. If you'd like to support us, you can follow us on Twitter at Gerhard's Ghost, or contribute on Patreon at Scholastic Lutherans. There you'll get access to our Telegram chat and other perks. Links can be found in the description. Subscribe, like, or leave a comment, and have a nice day.